yourself. Okay, hi everyone, and hi there. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, okay, so thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's, it's been really interesting, and as you can probably see from the title of my talk, I'm not actually, actually going to talk about curiosity uh, per se, but I'm going to be talking about something that might help you decide uh, what you what you should where you should go and explore. So if you think about what Katrina has been saying before, so if you take her pointing study, I guess the question I've been interested in is whether infants also reflect upon their own knowledge to decide whether they should gain particular information about that particular object or their, that other particular object from um, um, on purely internal ground, so just purely by you know, monitoring their prior knowledge basically. Um, so I will be <clears throat> referring to um, this as metacognition. So metacognition traditionally is defined as cognition by cognition, but you can already see that it's a really broad definition. So it's actually really useful to refine that definition and, um, ref and talk about um, uh, metacognition as um, encompassing any kind of process that is using a, bit, a metacognitive representation and metacognitive representation would mean a representation that contains information about another <coughs> cognitive representation. So for instance, if you have a memory trace, um, a metacognitive representation would be how much your memory, I mean, how reliable your memory trace is. So I take an example so that you uh, really um, can picture this in your mind. So imagine that my friend, my friend is texting me right now and she's asking where I am, so I need to recover, I, tr I need to try and recall the address. So I think we're on Tavistock Square, but I'm not super sure. So the, 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 the information that I recall comes with, with a degree of, of uh, reliability that I can estimate. And then I can use this to uh, decide whether I should respond to my friend straight away. So I can decide to respond to her because I'm sure that I know where we are. Or I'm actually not sure and I could go on Google Maps to check what the address is. So that, that is just an example of uh, a metacognitive, like a behavior that would rely on metacognitive processes. Um, and so this is an example actually of prospective metacognition. So this is like reflecting upon your knowledge before you actually take a decision. Um, but you can also do this of course after you've taken your decision. So you, re you can retrospectively uh, monitor whether your decision was correct or not. Uh, and this is uh, referred to in the literature as metacognitive sensitivity. So this ability that we have to uh, evaluate our own decision. So we can do that either by computing a probability that our decision was correct, so this is called decision confidence, or you can try and um, do something a bit more dichotomous, so decide whether your decision was correct or not. And uh, these two constructs could be related to learning in different ways, so for instance, um, in the case of prospective uh, metacognition, you could use this uh, to decide when you should um, uh, engage in, informa in information seeking because your current uh, knowledge reliability is low. So um, there's a lot of work, for instance, in the literature on meta-memory showing that people are able to adjust study time depending on whether they feel that they have learned a certain material uh, enough or not. Uh, so especially in the classroom, this, this, is, um, this can be useful. And um, an example in which you can use retrospective metacognition for learning is uh, when you need to learn from your errors without external feedback. So you can, of course, learn from your errors by only trial and error and observing the consequences of your actions. But you can also do this on purely internal grounds, so like just mo monitoring internally the accuracy of your own decision and learning from that. So there are indications in, in the literature that we can actually do that, so that spontaneous error corrections and the error-related monitoring activity, so in, especially in the ACC, relates to uh, subsequent learning. <coughs> so these are only two examples of how you could uh, use metacognition for learning and how you could use metacognition for also like information seeking. So now turning to the developmental literature, um, the reason that we started being interested in this question with uh, Sid uh, Quidel over there, who is uh, who was my uh, supervisor, my PhD supervisor, and, um, and the reason why we started talking about this is because there, there there's actually a, a, there has been a paradox in the literature, on uh, because on the one hand people have been documenting uh, documenting that 
young children seem to have really poor metacognitive abilities on the one hand and on the other hand, and Katrina talked about it before, uh, people have been documented, documenting that they are really proficient learners. So there is a seeming, I mean, there is a kind of tension between those two notions and uh, you, can, you could resolve this problem in two main different ways, uh, perhaps. So on the one hand, perhaps, children's metacognitive capacities have been underestimated before and they are actually able to monitor their own knowledge and use this for learning. Um, or perhaps they're only relying on purely bottom-up processes for learning and especially um, um, on, for instance, social selectivity and mechanisms that Katrina have been talking about before. Um, but our, our feeling was that perhaps uh, the first hypothesis is, is also is, is worth investigating, um, um, especially because um, in the literature, what people have been doing on, uh, in the literature on metacognition in children, uh, what people have been doing is basically <coughs> using verbal reports to ask children to report upon their own mental states. And um, it is the case that uh, you, when you um, ask children to report upon, upon their own uh, mental states, uh, when giving verbal reports, they actually have troubles doing this and um, um, they have troubles reporting and justifying their own mental states and in particular, they tend to overestimate their own knowledge and performances. So if you have kids at home, maybe you notice this, that if you ask kids, do you know how to do this? Do you know how to do that? Do you, have, do you, do you know this or that? Where did you get that informa information from? They are actually, in general, quite poor at, at, at uh, estimating this and they tend to say, yeah, I know. I know this, and uh, I've always known this, and this kind of this kind of things. So they have they, they have troubles uh, talking about their mental states and and and, uh, and um, monitoring them at the uh, explicit level. Uh, but what we thought, and other people have been uh, have been uh, thinking the same um, uh, in the literature more recently, uh, is that perhaps these are really limitations in in, in the verbal and explicit level of uh, metacognition. And so, um, more recently, there has been a couple of uh, studies investigating uh, metacognition in, in young children uh, using nonverbal reports. So, still self reports, but nonverbal. And actually, people have been able to show that um, from three years old, but it's quite weak in three years old, so perhaps four years old onwards, uh, if you test children on, on picture based, for instance, confidence scale, they are able to uh, report uh, confidence quite accurately. So, for instance, if you give them a picture, and they need to give you the name for the item, and then you ask them, do you feel a bit more like that little girl on the left or that little girl on the right? They will be able to report, uh, to use this scale to say that they are unsure more often after an incorrect response and sure uh, more often after a correct response, showing that they have some metacognitive sensitivity. And this actually fits with uh, the literature in other domains uh, on metacognition, and so especially uh, literature on animals and literature in adults and literature on computational models of uh, metacognitive sensitivity showing that actually um, rudimentary forms of metacognition such as uh, decision confidence for instance and error monitoring they rely on really simple computations so I will show some examples later on um, they can be expressed uh, non-verbally in animals so there is a huge literature now on metacognition in animals showing that uh, animals seem to be able to reflect upon their own uh, knowledge. Um, and also there is evidence from uh, human adults that metacognition can be deployed outside of uh, awareness. So this all came together and led pe some people to propose that you should really distinguish two processing modes of metacognition. So on the one hand you will have a kind of implicit system that um, uh, for instance, Nicolas Xi and colleagues uh, call uh, the system one metacognitive system, we call it implicit metacognitive system. Uh, Joel <coughs> calls it procedural metacognition. And so the system would, uh, uh, basically would allow you monitoring and controlling your own cognition uh, totally procedurally and automatically. And on the other hand, you have an explicit system uh, that allows you to talk and reason about mountain states, but they're kind of quite separate. And so the idea is that perhaps they also follow two developmental trajectories that are quite distinct. Um, so on the one hand, the explicit, explicit system, as I was uh, telling you, develops quite slowly and quite effortfully um, across childhood. But perhaps the other system is present uh, really early on and per perhaps already in infancy. 
So this is the hypothesis that we were trying to test. And to do this, what we did is uh, rely on implicit uh, behavioral measures and neural measures rather than, uh, than verbal self-reports. So I will present a first study in which we actually still rely on self-reports, but non-verbal self-reports in 20 months old, um, to test whether they have prospective metacognition. And then I will present a second study where uh, we wanted to test uh, younger babies, like 12 months old babies, and so we turn to really, um, be, um, really implicit markers of metacognition, so behavioral markers of decision confidence and neural markers of error monitoring. So the first study is uh, done with uh, Sid Quidel and uh, Margot roumont monnier who is uh, doing her master with us. And um, we asked, we, we were asking uh, whether infants ask for help when they know that they don't know. So if you think back to um, uh, Katrina's study with the pointing, we're basically wondering whether uh, they can you know, decide to point to a particular item because they know that they don't know the item. Um, and this study was based on um, on the opt-out paradigm that has been developed in the animal literature to test, um, uh, for instance, uh, resist monkeys' uh, metacognitive abilities. So what um, this experiment, so that's how the experiment uh, goes. So it was a hide and seek game where babies were seeing a toy being hidden under one of uh, two cups. So there was a cup on the left, a cup on the right, and the toy goes under one of the two cups. And then there's a curtain that is closed, and so the baby needs to remember the location of the toy for a variable delay. And then the curtain is opened again, and we ask the, the baby to point to indicate where he remembers the toy to be, so either on the left or on the right. And then we give him the box, and he can recover the toy if the toy is there, but if the toy is not there, there's nothing, and it's, it's not very nice. Um, and so we manipulated task difficulty in this task to manipulate the degree of uncertainty about the toy location, so whether the baby can remember very well where the toy is or not. So we did this simply by manipulating the duration uh, of the memorization, so how long the curtain is closed for. And we have also had impossible trials where um, the toy was uh, being hidden behind the curtain, so the baby really had no idea where the toy was in those trials. And the critical manipulation is that we had two groups of babies here. So we had a group of control babies who could only do the task by pointing on their own. And we had um, a group of test babies who could also eventually ask for help. So they had a caregiver uh, sitting next to the experimenter and the caregiver actually knew where the toy was all the time. And we had a familiar familiarization phase where we had you know, two trials where we told the baby that he could also look at his caregiver in the eyes if he wanted to get the information from the caregiver. So um, the, the, the experimenter in those familiarization trials would turn to the, uh, to the caregiver saying, um, show, show, show your baby where, where the toy is. And the baby, uh, as soon as the baby would look at the caregiver, the caregiver would provide the information. So um, um, the, the idea of this manipulation is that if infants are able to monitor whether they know where the toy is, um, if they can realize that they know where the toy is, they, they should point to indicate where the toy is. But if they feel that they don't know where the toy is, they should turn to their parents instead if they are given this opportunity. Um, so babies in the test group should um, ask for help specifically to avoid mistakes, and so they should perform better than, than control babies. And also, they should ask for help preferentially as the task difficulty, the task difficulty increases. So first, we looked at whether infants would turn towards their parents, or whether they would ask for help more often as task difficulty increases. increases sorry. And that's what we found. So we found that infants uh, ask for help more often for impossible trials um, as compared to possible trials. And within possible trials, they also ask for help uh, increasingly as uh, memorization delay uh, increases. Uh, but what's really crucial actually is that they do so, uh, in a, that they ask for help in a way that allows them to improve performances. Because here you could argue, for instance, that uh, they are just associating uh, particular events in the world to asking for help. So for instance, when there is an impossible trial, I will ask for help. So this is not like metacognitive monitoring, it's only monitoring the difficulty in the world, so the uncertainty in the world. And what we wanted to know is whether they monitor uncertainty in their own, 
uncertainty of their own prior knowledge. So what's really crucial is that you show that when they avoid responding by asking for help, they are actually doing so on trials where they were likely to, to make a mistake instead. And we found that uh, indeed the case that infants in the test group were performing better than infants in the control group. So they were perform they, they were so if we take only of course the pointing responses, uh, infants in the test group were uh, better than infants in the control group, su suggesting that they avoid making mistakes. And in tr interestingly, we found some uh, inter-individual variability in the control group. So we actually found that um, not all the babies use the asking for help option. So 14 infants actually never ask for help out of the 40. And uh, interestingly, they had performances that were equivalent to um, the performances of the control group. And they were performing worse than the babies, uh, the babies who use the ask for help option in the test group. So this suggests that really using the ask for help option um, allowed infants to avoid mistakes. And finally, we looked at that depending on task difficulty. So uh, when we looked only at uh, impossible trials, so here what, we, what I'm plotting is the percentage of uh, correct and incorrect responses. So basically for the babies in the, in the control group, it's, um, it's like comp computing accuracy, but for the babies in the, in the ask for help group, because they had th three options, you can then look at whether um, it's the percentage of correct um, trials that changes. So uh, maybe they perform more, um, more correct responses, or maybe they perform less incorrect responses. Um, um, and so you can look at whether basically the, the ask for help responses re replace correct responses or incorrect responses. And if you take only the impossible trials, you see that uh, overall babies uh, in the test group were, were performing less correct or incorrect responses, so indiscriminately, which is what you would expect because they have no information at all. But what you see in the possible trials where they could sometimes, they could recall the information and sometimes they couldn't recall the information, is that the, ma the manipulation actually impacts only the incorrect trials. So infants were actually specifically avoiding mistakes in the test group and they were performing the same rate of correct responses. So they're really avoiding mistakes by asking for help. Um, so to conclude on this first study, um, Infants uh, allowed to ask for help use this op option strategically to improve their performances, so they selectively avoid making errors and they preferentially def decline difficult choices. So this suggests that they monitor their own uncertainty and they are able to share this information with others in order to gain some help to achieve their goals. So then we were wondering about younger infants, so we wanted to test younger infants and uh, they can, you know, hardly point re reliably. I mean, of course, they can point, but point in this kind of task where the hide and seek paradigm is a bit harder, and also self-report for them is is harder because they are a bit more passive. So we used um, uh, instead anticipatory looking. So we had an eye tracking study where infants had to anticipate the appearance of a reward either on the left or on the right of the screen. And uh, here we wanted to measure retrospective metacognition. So infants had to perform a decision and then we were wondering whether they would be able to monitor the accuracy of that decision. So we relied on a measure uh, of post-decisional persistence that was uh, developed in the animal literature and I will show you the, the study in a second. Um, and the idea of this uh, post-decisional persistence measure is to uh, measure how much, how much like rats or um, babies or people uh, believe that their um, uh, decision was correct and be so believe uh, whether that they are going to have a reward or not. Um, and also we, we, we wanted to investigate neural uh, mechanisms, potential neural mechanisms of um, metacognitive sensitivity in, in uh, babies, so we uh, relied on the neural marker, but I won't be talking about this too much because uh, Sid talked to, talk to you about it on uh, Wednesday, but I will, I will briefly mention it. Um, so, we, because we wanted to measure decision confidence in a totally implicit way, we turned to that, um, to that study that was uh, uh, published in 2008 by uh, Capex and colleagues where they had rats um, performing an odor discrimination, so the rat is uh, presented with a mixture of odor and then he needs to move to a, a choice port. So it's a mixture of order A and order B, and then he has a choice port A or choice port B, so he's performing a first order decision. 
And of course, his accuracy in this task varies with the mixture of order. So when there's a lot of order A, it's, um, it's easy to perform the task. And when the mixture is 50-50, there are chance. Um, but what they did crucially in this task is that um, after moving to the choice board, the rat could receive a reward, but the reward, of course, was uh, contingent on the, on the accuracy of the decision. And the reward was um, given to the rat after a random uh, duration. So what they did with this is measure how long the rat is willing to wait for the reward in the choice board after making a choice. So the idea of this is that it's like an implicit deci post-decision wagering where if you believe that you're going to have a reward, you should wait. But if you believe that you have made a mistake, you should uh, abort the trial and, and try and restart so that perhaps you will get a new reward and perhaps you can perform a correct decision. And what they found interestingly was that uh, rats behaved in a way that completely um, uh, that was congruent with the idea that they computed uh, the probability that the decision was correct or decision confidence. So rats were waiting longer after a correct response and they were waiting less after an incorrect response. But this varied with the difficulty of the task. So when the task was really difficult, they were not able to discriminate and to evaluate the decisions. But when, as the task difficulty, difficulty decreases, uh, they were more and more able to monitor the decision and to wait. Uh, more when they were correct and less when they were incorrect. And um, they recorded neurons in the OFC and they found that uh, neurons in the OFC seem to represent that quantity. And importantly, in the subsequent study, uh, they uh, chemically inactivate the OFC and what they found was that uh, by doing this, they do not impact pers the perceptual choice. So the perceptual choice uh, is, um, is not affected by this manipulation, but uh, decision confidence is, so post-decision persistence was impacted by this inactivation, but not the perceptual choice. And for us it's important because it suggests that it's a really second order uh, monitoring mechanism that is implemented there. So it's not, uh, it's not directly related to the decision, it's rather it's using the decision to compute, to evaluate the, the accuracy. So we basically tried to do a similar paradigm with uh, 12 months old babies. <clears throat> so in this task we had um, alternating masks uh, on the left and right side of the screen and it was a gaze contingent paradigm. So as soon as the baby would look at the center of the screen, he would have a face cue appearing to the left or to the right, uh, quite briefly, between 50 to 300 milliseconds. And um, so this is manipulated so that the face, face cue is more or less visible. And crucially, after that, we had a waiting period, so the baby uh, had to make a decision to go to look uh, to the left or to the right, and after the waiting period, the reward was reappearing on the same, on the same uh, side. And um, we introduced that waiting period so we could measure how long babies were willing to wait for the reward on the choice that they had selected. So these are the first order uh, performances. So these are, this is basically the accuracy of the first look that the baby makes after he has seen the face cue. Um, so we found that babies were at chance for um, durations of the face cue uh, below, uh, between 50 milliseconds and 150 milliseconds. And they were better than chance only for uh, durations ranging from 200 to 300 milliseconds. So um, also based on previous study by uh, Sid and, um, and Sophie, we think that we can, uh, we can say that basically when babies were better than chance, they also had, uh, uh, they had seen the queue and when they were at chance, they were um, uh, not seeing the queue. So we then split the data in visible and invisible condition. And the rest of, the, of what I'm gonna show is, is splitting the data this way. Um, and so when we looked at the mean persistence time, so this is the time between, so after the baby has made a decision, how long he stays on the, on the side that he selected before he goes and looks away or goes and looks, uh, looks to the other side. Um, so we also found that um, infants were persisting more or less depending on the accuracy of their choice. So they were persisting more after a correct choice and they were persisting less after an incorrect choice, but this only in the visible condition and not in the invisible condition suggesting that they also um, compute decision confidence, so they estimate the probability that their first um, saccade was correct or not. <clears throat> so 
We found here that post-decision persistence in babies varies with first-order accuracy and task difficulty, so suggesting that it varies with the probability that the baby was correct when he made his first CAD. But I was, so here I want to acknowledge that this might not be yet a metacognitive marker. So, and this is actually a, a big debate in the literature at the minute, uh, whether decision confidence can be computed in a purely first-order fashion. Because if you think back to um, this idea, I mean, if you, if you take it that information is represented probabilistically in the brain, like we've been hearing a lot during this conference, um, Basically, uncertainty perhaps comes for free in the, in the perceptual representation. So if you have a probability distribution, you not only have the mean, but you also have the variance. So you can use the, this variance perhaps directly to infer whether uh, your representation is reliable or not. So it's actually even unclear at the, at the moment in the adults and animal literature where, whether you need to do an extra step in order to compute decision confidence, or whether you can already use what's in the perceptual decision straight away, which wouldn't be really metacognitive. So this is why we decided to turn to error, error monitoring, because error monitoring, there's a really huge literature on this, and it started in the, in the 70s with the rabbit's work, and from almost rabbit's work, we, we know that uh, error monitoring um, relies on post-decision or processing of the decision. So first you take your decision, and then you compare your decision with what you should have done, and that's how you, you compute uh, that you have made an error. Um, so this is a really metacognitive oper operation, right? Because you, you, you have to re represent your decision, and then you compare it to, some, to, to something else. So you have to have a second order uh, monitoring process. <laughs> And also we turn to neurodata because, um, as in the example I was showing before with the rats, you can uh, dissociate, thank you, um, in time and space uh, correlates of the perceptual decision and of the, the error monitoring. So perhaps you can say that the error monitoring uh, occurs independently of the, of the first order computation. Um, and I have only five minutes, so I think I'm going to go really quick on this because Sid told, told, told you about it on, on Wednesday. So we basically um, looked at whether infants elicit an error-related negativity after they perform uh, the decision. Uh, so the error-related negativity is a marker of error monitoring. So implicit error mo monitoring, because you have it after you, make an, uh, after you made an error, but you have it also when you made an error, but you didn't detect it at the conscious level. And we found that uh, infants, um, 12 months old infants in this task, uh, elicited an error-related negativity. So to conclude, um, infants already, um, I've shown you in the first study that infants already ask for help to avoid ma making errors, so suggesting that they can engage in prospective metacognition. Um, they exhibit behavioral markers of decision confidence and they possess uh, neural mechanisms of error monitoring, suggesting that they have also retrospective mechanisms, uh, retrospective metacognitive me mechanisms. So we think this is evidence that you know, rudimentary form, uh, forms of metacognition are present uh, really much earlier than what was uh, previously uh, described in the literature. And also evidence that we should really distinguish uh, in developments in particular between implicit aspects of metacognition and explicit aspects. So um, the explicit aspects are really slow to develop and they develop even uh, onto um, um, actually, even in adolescence. And uh, by contrast, implicit aspects of metacognition might be present really early on in development and they allow you to monitor and to control your cognition in a procedural and rather automatic fashion. Um, so, of course, one of the perspectives and in relation to this workshop is to now look at whether infants can also use metacognition for learning. So, uh, for instance, uh, an interesting question is whether they use this to seek particular information. So, um, when they estimate that their prior knowledge is low about a particular fact, would they go and explore, for instance? And would they uh, decide what kind of information they need to um, get on purely internal grounds? So is, is that something that they use? We don't, I think we don't know, and that's an, an interesting question to ask. Um, also, we can ask whether, uh, you know, they also update knowledge uh, after a mistake, so do they, do they learn um, by monitoring their own errors in a purely internal fashion, so when they have no external, external cues indicating to them whether they have made an error or not. Um, I think that's it, so I want to thank my um, supervisor, Sid, and Margot, and all my collaborators and the babies. <laughs> Thank you. That seems to me that in, in education,
cognition, we talk about metacognition an awful lot. It's one of the in things. But that seems to me to start the basis of potential conversation. Because apart from realising and reminding us, sometimes we underestimate what particularly young children can do. We need to have that. So that, I think that's a potential start of a conversation that could work across the boundaries. Okay, what about your questions? We've got... Go on. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm very interested by your perspective, which, which uh, f for people like me who, who, who develop models, uh, indeed, in many of the theories we, di we talked yesterday, metacognition is absolutely in essential in driving learning. One uh, of the ideas we discussed yesterday is that it's not only, or maybe not so much uncertainty in itself, which might drive exploration and learning, but the derivative of uncertainty. Like, um, and so the question is, uh, in those theories, uh, for the experimentalist, uh, do you think you could measure um, if those infants can uh, metacognitively measure not only uncertainty, but the evolution of uncertainty in given tasks or in given situations? So, you talk, so here you're talking about uncertainty in the world, right? That's my, okay, I have a second question. I am very much puzzled by your, by your distinction between uncertainty in the world and uncertainty in the brain. Because to me, everything is in the brain for the child. Okay, the world is something that you perceive through uh, sensors and representations are all in the brain. And, and, and so I have a second question, which is I'm not so sure what you mean, what you want to show with your first study in the sense that it means that as you, you I mean, like, what's the difference with, between what you observe and the, the more general process that uh, uh, infants can make decisions based on measures of uncertainty? And like, for example, if we just use the looking time paradigm that is, that is used in many of the experiments, the thing that we assume is that infants are interested by surprising events, for example, so we're kind of assuming they are able to measure that. And, and, and we kind of assume that they can make decisions on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, I'm not quite sure what's the difference between what we observe in everyday uh, experiments in, in the DevSci labs and the first study. So maybe I misunderstood, but... Uh. So, this was actually... Uh, so, so this is exa exactly the point, actually. So, the point is to try and correlate um, uncertainty in the world. So there, it was like, you know, the memorization uh, was varying, so memory trace phase away, so it's more and more uncertain. Um, but so the idea is uh, to say, um, so to decorrelate for two le for the same level of difficulty. So for you say you have to recall uh, for for nine seconds the the the, the, the location of the toy. Um, the idea is to decorrelate on the basis of, uh, of the behavior, so of, of, on the basis of the decision that the infant is going to make, uh, whether uh, he actually ha his internal representation was strong or weak, independently of the uncertainty that you presented to him in the world. So that's the idea. So if it depends on the performances rather than... So what I showed is that it, doesn't, it, it does vary with the uncertainty in the world, but it also uh, varies with uh, whether the infant with the performance. So with the with the, the accuracy of the response. So with the internal uh, representation. So it's not only about the strength of the belief, but it's about using the, the strength of the belief to computer uh, to computer decision. One, two, three. One, two. Um, so I had two questions about your memory experiment. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is about the individual variability. So what do you really think is going on there? So first about the ages of the kids. I didn't understand. They're about 12. Oh, yeah. They're Sorry. homogeneous. They're about 12 months. 20 months. 20 well, months. I see. So, the, so age couldn't really account no, no, they're for all that. The same. They're, they're all the same. same age. So I was wondering if what you think accounts for the kids who didn't ask for help do you really think they didn't know when they needed help, or maybe they didn't want to ask for help? So I, I think um, it's actually yeah. an interesting perspective to try and look at this uh, inter-individual variability, because here, of course, it's conflated with whether the baby has a strong social bond with his caregiver, for instance. So maybe they yeah. have a really weak bond with the, the particular parent that came that Or day. maybe they just so don't want to express their uncertainty. Or maybe they, don't they didn't want to. Want to. So right. actually, it's really, yeah. it's, we really don't know here. So right. that's something that would be interesting to explore whether, you know, yeah. 
it's, it's something meaningful or not. And if it's something meaningful, does it relate to, for instance, learning uh, abilities and these kind of things? Right. And the second question was whether in that same experiment, so you, you had two conditions in which either there is no information, no knowledge where the object is, or perfect information. I wonder if you could look at the intermediate cases. So you could hide the object behind a curtain, but sometime the experimenter switches the object. So, and you can vary the proportion of trials in which there's an, as it could be, you know, in 20% of trials there's a switch, 30, 40, 50, to see if, the, if there is actually a graded representation or something like all or none or some quantitative, you know, how fine graded this representation is. Mm -hmm. So I guess, um, I guess this is what we're trying to do when we manipulate the memorization delay. We're trying to manipulate this in, in a great fashion, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right, so, there's so, some indication. So an interesting but... thing would be to manipulate, yeah, whether the, for instance, whether the, the, the caregiver is a perfect informant or, or not. And, and this, this would be also interesting to see how it, in, how it plays like the, the, you know, the, the difficulty of the task and also whether the informant is, in, uh, is I mean, whether the person is, is per perfectly informative or not really informative and how does it like change the way that babies will ask for help, how they will, you know, right. take all of this into account to decide whether they should respond by themselves or whether they should uh, ask for help. Right, but I think that the quantitative curve is important there because you could, uh, we don't really know how uncertainty is represented and there could be a, uh, a zero one thing. So the moment you, uh, you, uh, you, if you notice even one violation, mm -hmm. your uncertainty may just jump and be high, right? So <coughs> it's a question with, you know, how fine it is. Okay, so my question was actually very related also to inter-individual variability. So it will maybe, I will change it a bit. Uh, I'm thinking, I'm wondering what is the source also of those children who don't ask for help? And could it be, and are you aware of any study which uh, relate the metacognitive abilities of the parents and the bias maybe in the way of reporting confidence? So it's known that we are biased in our confidence reports. Like we tend to show more confidence that we really uh, feel. And uh, is there any relationship possible between abilities, metacognitive abilities in the parents and in the children, and in this decision of the children to report to the parents or to themselves use uh, metacognitive estimates to guide decisions? That's a, that's, yeah, that's a little but bit so. a related question, but I don't, I don't know. I think we need to, you know, this is interesting to explore. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> I don't know. Hi, great talk. Um, I have a very different question. I'm fighting with your definition of implicit metacognition. Um, and mostly because I think what you put under that bag is something that I think of as being shared across uh, most of the species that do decision making. So you showed us that in rats, you would have your implicit metacognition, and there are studies now being done in fly and insects where the same processes are also at play. So then I'm wondering, is that, am I putting the wrong word in your mouth? And then is it a useful construct to call it metacognition, or are we going to bring more confusion to the field? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is actually, you know, it's a really hot debate in the literature at the minute. So how do we define metacognition? So that's why, in the beginning, I, I, I say, you know, this is the traditional definition, cognition by cognition, but it's not very specific. So you could put into that, you could put any, any form of uh, cogni uh, cognitive control almost. So this is why it's important to refine it as, you know, like it's metacognitive when you're using a representation that contains information about another representation. And so I think I would, I would you know, uh, be careful with, uh, with, you know, saying that bees, for instance, have metacognition but and this kind of thing. Because as, as soon as you have a measure of uncertainty, it is a measure of, of information about another information, and so. Um, yeah, that's exactly yeah, what I'm the, fighting with. <laughs> but the thing is, how do you? I mean, how do you use it then? Do you, do you represent it somewhere? Else? Do you use it for behavior? How do you use it for behavior? Yeah, that's the question. The that so is that all all organisms that most that we know make decisions based on measures of uncertainty. Mm. Even, 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 even 
Sorry, can everybody, can, can, just, can, can everybody hear the conversation? That's all I'm worried about. Can, can, yeah. can I just add one word to that? I think that one word. The, the, yeah. So the point here, really, one sorry, something. Sorry. Three. The point here, really. I think we all See, agree. Can't even work out what it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so the point here, really, is I think we all agree on, on, on the fact that, I mean, we should maybe not call it implicit metacognition. But the main point here is to show that what has been thought to reflect metacognition in children in the past, using explicit measures like reports, for instance, is totally underestimating their competences. So here, you can call it the way you want, but it just shows that very young, those infants are able to do this second order representation, uh, computation on the first order. It's not clear how uncertainty is computed. It's not clear whether it's reflecting their own uncertainty or a mix between the, their own uncertainty and the uncertainty about the environment. But the main point here in talking about implicit is that it's just non-reportable or, or an implicit setting, more than like some form of non-conscious process or, or whatever. Mm, yeah, so I'll just add something to that actually. So it's not so obvious. So if you take the Bayesian framework and so on, it, it looks like it's really obvious, but it's not actually really obvious. So there are studies, for instance, in adults now showing that actually we're bad at estimating. So if you ask observers to, to estimate the uncertainty in the stimuli, they are bad at doing this. So it's not actually trivial. And I think it's, it's an important distinction. And also, you can't do something, you can't do metacognition on something that is perceived unconsciously. So it's not totally trivial, and it's not totally obvious that you can use uncertainty in the system. You cannot always use the uncertainty in the, in the system. So the point here is to try and you know, distinguish this and to try and understand when you can use the, the uncertainty in the system to control behavior and when you cannot do it. So, yeah. Okay, question, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I had a question about your uh, CAPEX-like experiment with the looking time in the baby. Mm -hmm. uh, so that a brilliant idea and the result took uh, similar between the two, but there seems to be like one difference, which is that in the rodent experiment, uh, the timing of the uh, reward delivery is uncertain. It follows like this uh, survival distribution. Mm -hmm. And this is because it is uncertain that uh, your uh, subjective probability of being correct should translate into uh, different uh, waiting times. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understood that in your experiment th there was not such uncertainty. And therefore my question is, do you think that's really the same interpretation, that this waiting time is reflecting your uh, subjective probability of being correct? No, you're right. It's true that um, it's, it's a methodological difference, but I don't think it actually really changes the interpretation of the results, no, um, I don't think it does, because the the reward is not even contingent on the on the response of the baby actually. So it's ju just you know like, um, yeah, I don't think I just don't think it changes the interpretation. Okay, I'd, I'd love to talk more. Yeah. Um, the just last well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, that's right. Just a really quick question, just to, I'm sorry to get back to the metacognition issue. But, no, it's, um, that's the interesting yeah. question. Well, always. newborns less, you know, three days or less, who have very poor motor control can nevertheless uh, control their hands enough so that statistically they can move their hand into an intercepting uh, laser beam, which you can't see, but if, if you cut it with your hand, there's a red spot there, so they're getting feedback. And they do it I iteratively. Is this a form of metacognition? This is motor control, right? Uh, yes, but it's also error detection. But it's not error. De it's not error detection on a. Cogn it's not a cognitive representation, like. I don't know. That's my question. Or, yeah. No, no. I mean, this wouldn't go in uh, the, the the box. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, I'm sure some of the conversations carry on. You are now allowed to stand up and have coffee. But. <laughs>